Hi everybody, we're taking a look at Achieve Section 3.4 here, where we're doing some minor uh, applications of derivatives. The applications in this section, as I said, are minor, just because our derivative skills are not very robust at this point. As we learn more derivative uh, uh, shortcut formulas, we'll be able to do more interesting uh, applications. So mainly in this section, we're looking at uh, the Galileo's formula, the vertical position formula for uh, position and velocity and acceleration, and a few other uh, applications like marginal cost or uh, impact velocity, average rate of change, things like that. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this first problem here. It says that the rate of change for an area of a square with respect to its side s when s is four. We're supposed to find that rate of change. Now, just because I'm more accustomed to dealing with x than s, I went ahead and said, well, the area of a square would be side times side. If I allow the side of the square to be called x instead of s, then I can say, well, side times side, the area formula would just be x squared. So the function here is f of x is equal to x squared. The derivative of that function, f prime of x, would just be the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. Now, we're supposed to evaluate that rate of change, the derivative, when x is equal to 4. So you just plug a 4 into your derivative formula, 2 times 4, we get our 8. So you can see up here the rate of change is 8 square units per unit increase. Uh, so that would be our first problem. Now for number 2. It's asking us, it says, at what rate is the root, the sixth root of x, changing with respect to x when x is five? So the way I got my answer there is I said, well, okay, if I have the sixth root of x, I need to call that x to the one sixth power in order to take the derivative more easily. So then the derivative, which will give me the rate of change formula, is going to be one sixth x to the one sixth minus one, that's one over six minus six over six, I get x to the negative five over six power. Now I'm supposed to evaluate this rate of change for the root of six function uh, when x is equal to five. So you're just plugging a five into the derivative. So when I did that, the first thing I did was I, I preferred to, to rewrite my derivative in more proper form. I know that if I have x to the negative five over six, then I have the sixth root of x to the fifth power in the denominator. So the better written derivative answer is one over six on the sixth root of x to the fifth. And then when you evaluate that at five, you just plug a five in for x. Now, I left my answer like that because otherwise you're just going to get some irrational decimal and achieve is wanting an exact answer. So you'll see the answer that they wanted is just like I had, although they did have a slight uh, uh, font error with the sixth root, it looks like the root's going through the six. So that's one over six on the sixth root of five to the fifth power, and it liked it. For the next question here, pretty quick and easy, it just said, find the rate of change uh, of the circle diameter with respect to the radius. So you just say, well, your diameter formula with respect to the radius, the diameter is just twice the radius. So whatever the radius is, the diameter is twice that. So not much of a function here that we're taking the derivative of. So I have the diameter is equal to two times the radius. That's true for every single circle in existence. Now, I need to take the derivative of this equation with respect to r. So I can just say, well, then the derivative of the diameter with respect to r, or d prime of r, whichever way you like to call it, it's just the derivative of this. You'd say, well, it's just two. So you can say that your rate of change is always two. The diameter is always increasing at twice the rate of whatever the radius is increasing at. So not too much to that problem, not to that problem. Uh, the next one here, it's the change in volume with respect to the radius. So it's talking about a cylinder has a height equal to its uh, radius. Uh, find the rate of change of the volume with respect to the radius. Now, first of all, and they don't mention it here, but you need to know the volume of a cylinder formula. Well, the volume of any cylinder is going to be pi r squared h. But now they say in the problem 
uh, it says that the height is equal to the radius. So that just means I can replace H with R. That's what I've done here. Pi R squared instead of times H times another R, which is going to give me pi r cubed, again, since the height is equal to the radius. Now I'm supposed to take the derivative of that, so I'd say, well, no problem. V prime with respect to r, that's going to give me 3 pi r to the second. Final answer. And that's what I did there. Next question here for number five. Oh, good. One of the longer questions. Now, uh, for this problem, uh, it's giving me a graph to find my values, and then it's wanting to know the average velocity over certain intervals. Well, first of all, it's wanting me to look at this graph and find the average velocity from 0 to 0.5. So here's what I did. I said, well, the average velocity from 0 to 0.5, what I know I need to do is find the velocity at uh, 0.5 first. It's going to be the ending position minus the beginning position over the change in time. So S of 0.5 minus S of 0 over 0.5 minus 0. The position at 0.5, well the position at 0.5 is 50. Minus the position at 0, well my, obviously the position at 0 is at 0. So that's where I got this 50 minus 0 here. Now all that's over the change in the time which is half of an hour. So uh, my distance is measured in kilometers, my time is measured in hours, so this is a change in 50 kilometers in half of an hour, so 100 kilometers per hour on average in this period. So I can say, and that's approximately 62 miles per hour, but 100 kilometers per hour, okay, average. Now, the next question asks for the average rate of change from 0.5 to 1. So again, I just say, well, it's the ending position minus the beginning position over end time minus beginning time. The position at 1 looks like it's at 100, obviously minus the position at 0.5, which was 50. So again, your change in position, you're going 50 kilometers upward in this case, divided by the uh, half of an hour time period, you're still going at a rate of 100 kilometers per hour. Now the average rate of change from 1 hour to 1 and a half hour, well notice, your function up here is constant in this period. It has the exact same beginning and ending position over this time period from 1 to 1.5. So I can say, well, okay, yeah. Your ending position is 100 kilometers. Your beginning position was 100 kilometers. So clearly, you've averaged zero kilometers per hour in that time period. Your change in position was zero. Now, from 1 uh, to 2, you just say, well, the ending position, S of 2, minus the beginning position, S of 1. The ending position, S of 2, goes back down to 50 kilometers uh, distance from the original position. So I can say, well, that's 50 minus, in the beginning of this period, we were 100 kilometers away. So we've went negative 50 kilometers in this span of a one-hour time period. So on average, you've went negative 50 kilometers per hour in this period. And I believe that that is all that they ask in this problem. Yep, that's it. Pretty straightforward problem. It's a nice reminder of our average rate of change. Uh, now, for the next one, it's giving us a, a, in fact, I think it's the exact same uh, graph from the preceding problem, but now it's asking us some other problems that we don't necessarily have to calculate, we just have to look. So if I say over the interval 0.5 to 1, well from 0.5 to 1, if I'm looking at that, please, uh, if you're trying to find something out about the velocity, remember the, the, the function that's given is the position function. So I know that the change in position over the change in time would be velocity. So the slope of this function represents velocity. The steeper the slope, the greater the velocity. The flatter the slope just means the velocity is zero. Any negative slope is going to be, indicate a negative velocity. So when I'm looking at this first question, and it's saying over the interval 0.5 to 1, which of these is correct? Now, I could see somebody thinking, well, why is it not the first one? Well, because the position is increasing. Is the velocity increasing? No way, Jose. How do I know that? Look at the slope at 0.5. It's a very steep slope. By the time you get to 1, what's happened to the slope? It's flattened out. 
Well, that slope is not increasing, therefore the velocity is not increasing. Now, is the velocity negative? Is that function decreasing? No, so it's not negative. Is the velocity decreasing? Yes, because the velocity is the slope of this function. It's the rate of change of the distance over the time. So, and I, and I can say that slope starts off very steep, gets less steep, gets less steep, all the way down to nearly a slope of zero in this region. So I can say clearly the velocity is decreasing in that region. Now, from 1.5 to two, well, from 1.5 to 2, it's pretty much the uh, mirror opposite case. It starts off with a zero slope, and it becomes more negative throughout that region, so it's going to become more negative. But then by the time you get to 2, it's a zero slope again. So I can say, well, it's clearly decreasing everywhere, uh, or sorry, the position is decreasing. Now, I can't say the velocity is decreasing because it starts off decreasing, but then it goes back to zero. So the velocity is not decreasing that whole period. The position is decreasing the whole period. Uh, and since the position is decreasing the whole period, I can say the velocity is negative. But now, please be very, very careful. I could see somebody saying, well, why isn't the velocity decreasing? If the velocity is decreasing, the slope would have to get more and more and more steeper, negative, negative, negative. It would almost look like you have a vertical asymptote at two because it would have to keep on getting more and more negative in order to be continually decreasing. Uh, this slope is not continually decreasing because it flattens off. The greatest rate of decrease is right in the middle at about 1.75, and then by the time you get to two, it's not as negative, so it's not as uh, much decreasing as it was in the middle. But what I can say about everything in that region, well, has a negative velocity because it has a negative slope. Uh, now my last one here, over the interval 2.5 to three, well look, 2.5, okay, it's increasing up to three. This is pretty much the same thing as what happened from 0.5 to one. From 2.5 to three, it starts off with a positive slope or a positive velocity. That positive velocity stays positive until I get to three, and then it looks like it flattens off and becomes a zero velocity at three. Uh, so in order to answer what I have here, velocity is negative. Nope, it would have to be decreasing. Uh, the velocity is decreasing. Yep, just like the first interval between 0.5 and 1 starts off uh, pretty high velocity. Uh, because the rate of change, the slope is uh, great, and then that slope gets less and less and less through the region to where it flattens out and would have a zero velocity at three. So I can say, yes, the velocity is decreasing, but it is positive. Uh, now, uh, velocity is increasing. If, if the velocity were, were to be increasing, that slope would have to continually get steeper and steeper and steeper throughout the region. So it can't be that. Uh, now, looking at number seven. We have a problem in which it says the velocity in centimeters per second of a blood molecule flowing through a capillary of radius 0 0.008 centimeters is given by the formula V of R is equal to scientific notation 6.4 times 10 to the eighth minus 0.002 R squared. We know that the distance from the molecule to the center of the capillary is given by R. And we're supposed to just find the rate of change of this velocity formula with respect to R if R is 0.007 centimeters. Okay, so through a lot of information in there, really to be honest, that we didn't need, all we have to do is say, well, here's our equation in the problem. All I have to do is take the derivative of that equation, evaluate it for 0.007, and I'm done. That's what I did here, guys. You can see the work for this problem pretty quick. I took my uh, my velocity with respect to R, the, the radial distance here, the scientific notation, uh, constant minus 0.002 R squared. Now, when I take the derivative, I need to understand that uh, this term right here, that's just a constant. That's a very small constant. Derivative of any constant, zero. Now, the derivative of the r squared term, I know the two is going to come down in front, multiply its coefficient. That's where I'm getting negative 0.004 r to the first. Now I'm supposed to evaluate this formula for r is equal to 0.007. That's 
that's what I did. I'll get negative 0.004 times 0 0.007, and I get negative 0 0.4028, and I put that answer in, and the chief thought it was great. Uh, now, for the next one here. Again, it's a uh, problem in which is giving us a formula and it's asking us to evaluate the derivative at a certain value. So the actual application is really, to be honest, irrelevant to our solution process. I just need to look at the formula provided within the problem. And then they're telling us to to evaluate the derivative of this formula at a certain value. So before I even worry about the value that I'm uh, taking the derivative at, uh, I, need to I need to take the derivative. So, okay, instead of treating this as a quotient, look what I did. I just said, well, I, instead of taking that number in scientific notation and dividing by r squared, how about I take that number in scientific notation and multiply it by r to the negative two. This allows me to avoid uh, the quotient rule. So now when I take the derivative the easier way, I just say, well, this is now just a coefficient of r to the negative two. The negative two comes down and multiplies that. When it does, it multiplies this part right here and it becomes negative 5.98 times 10 to the 16th. And then remember, your exponent drops by one, so it becomes r to the negative third. I went ahead and put it back in the format of the original. I can say, well, this answer is the same thing as negative 5.98 times 10 to the 16th divided by r cubed. Now, whenever I evaluate this at my uh, 6.77 times 10 to the 6th, because that's what they ask me to evaluate my derivative at, uh, I just plugged that into the calculator and I got the negative 0.00. 0193. Uh, now, keep in mind, your calculator will do these problems pretty nicely. Uh, let me move it over here so there's no sheen. Uh, but I can just say, I'll set up a fraction on my calculator. I'll make this larger so you can see more. Uh, what I can do is I can set up a fraction on my calculator, and I can say, well, uh, I'll go alpha y equals, and the numerator of that fraction, See if I can make that a little more clear. There we go. The numerator of that fraction is my negative 5.98 times 10 to the 16th. And then my denominator of that fraction here, I can say, well, that's my 6.77 times 10 to the 6 quantity cubed. Since that's inside of a group, I'll go ahead and do my group. And then my 6.77 times 10 raised to the sixth, I'll arrow out, close my group, raise that group to the third, and then keep in mind, I, whoop, I hit enter, not the negative sign. I'll delete that off. And now I hit enter. And it gave me my answer in scientific notation. Uh, but I, I remember, oh, that, that four just means that there's four zeros, including the zero to the left of a decimal, which I never write. So it would be negative. 0 0.000 and then 193. So they wanted six decimal places, so negative 0 0.000. Again, remember there would be another zero to the left of the decimal if you wanted to put it, and then the 193. Uh, nice problem there. Now, um, and remember, six decimal place accuracy, they don't want the scientific notation answer, they want the decimal answer. Same thing here in the next problem, they're wanting a six decimal place accurate answer, uh, where again, they're just giving me a function and asking me to evaluate the derivative at a certain value. So, pretty straightforward again. I just say, okay, here's my original function given in the problem. The derivative of that function, I know negative one half is going to come down and multiply this. When it does, one half times 2.82, that's easy. That's just going to be 1.41. Of course, the negative changes this to negative. Uh, so there's my number in scientific notation. I say the R value now has to be to one lower power to the negative three over two power. Uh, and then just to show uh, the, the uh term without the negative exponent, you wouldn't have to since the original had negative exponents, but I just like the looks of this better. Uh, now when I evaluate, I just say, well, I'm supposed to evaluate at their value of, uh, goodness, it looks like 
uh, 10,890,000 uh, for uh, to plug into my derivative. When I plugged that into this formula, I got the answer on my calculator again of negative 0. 0.000392. And again, they want the answer in decimal form, not scientific notation form. So you'll have to convert your calculator's scientific notation form to decimal form. Uh, if I look at this next problem, it says a particle moving along a line has a uh, position t to the fourth minus 12 t meters at time t seconds. And then it says at what time t for any time greater than zero, so time cannot equal zero, time cannot equal a negative number in this value, uh, does the particle pass through the origin? Okay, so that's, that's pretty easy. If I want to know when a particle passes through the origin, that's going to be whenever the position is equal to zero. So I can just say, well, all I would do is I'd take my position function that they gave me and I would set it equal to zero. It's easy to set equal to zero because it factors out easily. I can say greatest common factor if t squared gets factored out. And when I do, it's left with t squared minus 12. Now, zero product property tells me your solutions are gonna be when t squared is zero, which gives you t equals zero but I know that that's not valid because it said time has to be greater than zero, so I ignore that one. And then my other one is gonna be when t squared is equal to 12, which would give me t is equal to positive negative 12. But again, we're talking about time. Time can't be negative, that's what I put over here. So the only realistic answer is the t is equal to the square root of 12, which they wanted to three decimal places this time, so I put 3.464 and they liked it. Now you see for the rest of this problem, it's just saying at what time t where t is greater than zero is the, is the particle instantaneously motionless. So at what point in time is it not moving? You just say, well, okay, the rate of change of position is velocity. They're just saying, I wanna know when the velocity is zero. Well, solve for the time at which the first derivative is equal to zero. Gorgeous. I take the first derivative, derivative of t to the fourth is 4t cubed, derivative of 12t squared is 24t. Of course, I keep the minus sign in between. Now, if I wanna set this equal to zero, again, I factor. This time I can factor out a common factor of 4t. When I do, once again, I'm left with the first term of t squared, my second term would be minus six. You'll still get t is equal to zero, but we know that that's not a valid answer since t has to be greater than zero. My other answer would be t is equal, or t squared would equal six, which means t is equal to the positive or negative root of six. Again, since t is positive, uh, I'll just say I know my answer is just the positive root of six, which I'm getting the 2.449 here, and achieved like the bad answer. Uh, up next here, it's asking us, it says, what is the velocity of a ball dropped from a height of 70 meters when it hits the ground? take upward direction as positive, okay? And in this problem, we're supposed to use the gravitational constant 9.8 meters per second every second, okay? Uh, so what I did here, this is gonna require us to think of Galileo's formula. I can say, well, the position at time, time t is just the original position plus the original velocity times time minus one half the gravitational constant times time squared. And then I can say the derivative of that, uh, any derivative of any constant is gonna be zero, so you'll see the original position canceled out. Derivative of v sub zero times t, that's just gonna be v sub zero. And when I take the derivative of this, the two would come down, multiply the one half to just give me minus g times t. So I can see, yep, your velocity is derivative of the position function. Now the things that we're supposed to keep in mind in this problem, First of all, I know the original velocity is zero. Why? Because it says the, the velocity of a ball that was dropped. If the ball was just dropped, then it wasn't thrown at any certain uh, original velocity or anything. It was, its original velocity was just zero. So I can say, okay, uh, no original velocity zero anytime it says dropped. That means my position function was just going to be the position that it was at, in my case, it was a height of 70 meters above the ground, so 70, and then minus one half the gravitational constant, 9.8 meters per second every second, times t squared. 
So I can plug that in and get 70 minus 4.9 T squared. Now, it's, uh, it's asking us uh, in the problem, what is the velocity of the, pall, of the ball from a height of 70 meters when it hits the ground? So I need to know the impact velocity. So if I need to know the impact velocity, I need to be able to evaluate the velocity function at however many seconds it takes it to hit the ground. Well, that's what I'm going to find. That's what I'm asking right here. How many seconds will it take till the ball hits the ground? Well, that's your position function. You take your position function, set it equal to zero. When you do, you can say, well, 70 minus 4.9 T squared is equal to zero. That's going to give me 4.9 T squared is equal to 70. Uh, and then 70 over 4.9 is equal to T squared. And then you can say, well, then T is going to equal the square root of 70 divided by 4.9, and I know it's just the positive square root, so I don't put plus or minus, time has to be positive. And so then I can say, well, since that was an irrational number and I'd like to be as exact as I can, I didn't even get a decimal for this, I plugged that value into my velocity equation. And I can say, well, my velocity equation uh, was um, just going to be the, uh, right up here, the original velocity, which is zero, minus the gravitational constant times time. So that's zero minus 9.8 times the time, which is this expression right here. When I plugged that in, I got negative 37.041 meters per second. And the negative answer does make sense since this velocity uh, is moving downward when it hits the ground from this original up high position. Pretty cool problem there. Now for the next one here, uh, next one and last one. Well, no, 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 there's, an, there, there's one after this. This is the last one that required me to have any work shown out. That's why I thought it was the last one when I looked at my work. Um, so for number 12 here, it says a ball is tossed vertically from ground level and returns to the earth 18 seconds later. What was the initial velocity of the ball and what's the maximum height that the ball uh, that, 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 that the ball reaches. Uh, now, again, we're using a gravitational constant, 9.8 meters per second every second. We need to know the original position and the maximum height the tank. Okay, let me go ahead and maximize this to show you my work. So first of all, we know that the original position, it was on the, it was on the earth, it was at ground level. And it took 18 seconds for it to get back to the ground. Okay, now, I can look at my position function, which I, I know since the original position is zero, it's just going to cancel out and I'll have well, whatever the original velocity is times the time minus one half the force due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second times T squared. Now, we know in this problem that the position at 18 seconds is zero. So I can say this will enable me to solve for that original velocity because since it takes 18 seconds for it to get back down into the ground, I can plug 18 in for T and use that to solve for the original velocity. Notice what I've done here. If I plug 18 in for T, this is the same thing as 18 times V sub zero. We know this right here is minus 4.9 and it's gonna be times T squared times 18 squared. I set that equal to zero. Well, this part right here, minus 4.9 times 18 squared, uh, that gave me uh, 1,587.6. Uh, I moved that to the right-hand side of my equation and got 18 times the original velocity is equal to 1,587.6 divided by 18. You get your original velocity is 88.2 meters per second. Now I can say, okay, Use this to create your true position function. Your true position function is original velocity times time. I know my original velocity now is 88.2. So 88.2 times T minus one half the gravitational constant or 4.9 T squared in this case. Uh, now we need to find the maximum height. Well, the maximum height occurs when the velocity is zero. Please think about that. All the way up, it has positive velocity. At the point where it reaches its maximum height, it has a zero velocity. And then on the way down, it's gonna have a negative velocity. So I can say, okay, uh, I need to solve for when the first derivative or the velocity is equal to zero. 
Uh, the derivative of my position function would just be 88.2 minus 9.8t. If I set that equal to zero, I'm getting 88.2 is equal to 9.8t. Divide by 9.8 and you're going to get 9. Now, that should also make sense because if it's at the ground at 0 and at 18, then it's going to reach its maximum height right in between these two, which is 9 seconds. So you could have also used logic there. I wanted to use the calculus by setting the first derivative equal to 0. But now, that's the time at which it attains its maximum height. I need to know the position. Well, then you just plug 9 into your position function. And we had our position function right here, 88.2 times 9 minus 4.9 times 9 squared. Gorgeousness, 396.9 meters. Uh, now, the last question, there was nothing to show. It was more one of these just logic questions. Uh, it says, which if any of the following statements is true for a falling object under the influence of gravity near the surface of the Earth? Now, Keep in mind, it's a gravitational constant. In feet per second, we know that objects fall at an increasing rate of 32 feet per second every second. So after one second, it's gonna be falling by 32 feet per second. After two seconds, 64 feet per second. After three seconds, 96 feet per second. It keeps on speeding up at a rate of 32 feet per second every second. That's the gravitational constant. In meters per second, that's just 9.8 meters per second every second, the rate of increase. Uh, now, whenever we're thinking about that, it says the distance traveled increases by equal amounts in equal, um, uh, in, in, in equal time intervals. And that's, that's absolutely not true. And you think, well, well, why is it not true? Because as objects are falling, they're falling more and more and more rapidly unless they hit the ground. So you'd say the uh, amount of distance it travels in the first second is surely not equal to the amount of distance it's going to travel in the second second or any second after that. It's going to continue to increase for equal time intervals. So that one is uh, absolutely false. Uh, the velocity increases by equal amounts in equal time intervals. Yeah, that's true. Why? Because it's a uh, gravitational constant. So it's being pulled down continuously at a rate of 9.8 meters per second every second uh, acceleration. So the velocity is going to continue to increase by that constant acceleration. Uh, so I can say, yeah, for every second that, that, that increases in meters, the velocity is going to increase by 9.8 meters per second every single second. Uh, so it's going to increase by equal amounts, absolutely true. The derivative of velocity increases with time. So I can say, well, okay, the velocity, uh, uh, derivative of velocity is acceleration. And we know that the, that the gravitational constant, it's negative. Uh, so it's certainly not going to increase the velocity. It's going to decrease the velocity since it's going down. And I can say, well, then that makes that statement false. All right, guys, so that finishes up this section 3.4. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, we'll get into more, we, we will get into more interesting applications later on in the class and certainly more interesting applications in Calc 2.